Well, welcome everybody. Um, just listening to that piece of music, it's certainly not too soon to be getting on with this afternoon's um, webinar. Um, a very warm welcome to the University of Tasmania online series for alumni, our new series called Explore. Um, firstly, as a reflection of this institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Palawa people and custodians of the land upon which we meet and pay respect to our elders past, present and emerging. My name is uh, Kate Robertson and I'm the Executive Director um, of the Advancement Team here at the University of Tasmania and part of my portfolio means that I have responsibility for um, our alumni community and I work with some wonderful colleagues in the team to bring you this program this afternoon. So it's a great uh, honour and privilege to have you with us um, this afternoon. Um, the series Explore has been devised in order to provide you with an opportunity to um, connect with the university, but uh, in particular to provide you with opportunities for advancement and inspiration to learn about new things, try new things. So um, it's really good to have so many of you joining us from all around the world uh, this afternoon, if you're here with us in Australia, um, but um, whether it's breakfast, lunch, dinner, or the middle of the night, a warm welcome to you. One of the great advantages of being a member of the alumni community is the ability to tap into the wonderful group of influential individuals and the expertise that we have available to us across our global community. This series offers uh, an exclusive opportunity for you to connect not just with your peers, but also um, perhaps find among them innovators, thought leaders, and possibly even future collaborators. So we're really pleased to give you this opportunity um, today. You are such an important part of the fabric of the university uh, and that's why we're, we're really happy to be putting on those things which respond to the interest that you've um, shared with us. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get on to the, uh, the main topic for today. Um, your microphone, camera and chat function and the raised hand function for those of you who are familiar with Zoom, um, they have all been disabled in order to make sure that um, Danielle is not interrupted during her presentation. Um, but we do encourage you to think of questions as you go through her presentation and um, put them into the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, don't use the chat function because um, that's not available, but if you put them into the Q&A function, once Danielle's finished speaking, um, we will take your questions and put them to her. And then um, the last thing that I need to let you know is that this lecture is being recorded. Um, it'll be available on our YouTube channel um, later. So um, just to be mindful of that as we, as we go through. And so now it gives me really great pleasure to, uh, without further ado, to get on to the main item for today. I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce you to Dr. Danielle Wood, who's a senior lecturer in uh, English in the School of Humanities here at UTAS. She received a Bachelor of English with honours at the University of Tasmania in 1993 and her PhD at Edith Cowan University in Western Australia in 2001. Her thesis included the novel The Alphabet of Light and Dark, which won the prestigious Australian Vogel's Literary Prize in 2002 and the Adobe Award in 2004. Dr Wood was a judge for the 2013 and 2014 Australian Vogel Literary Prize. In 2004 and 2007, the Sydney Morning Herald named Dr Wood one of the best young novelists of the year. Dr. Wood writes fiction and non-fiction for both adults and children, and her work includes Rosie Little's Cautionary Tales for Girls, Mother's Grimm, and Housewife Superstar, the very best of Marjorie Bly. As Minnie Dark, she is the author of Starcrossed and The Lust Lost Love Song. She also collaborates with fellow Tasmanian writer Heather Rose to write children's novels under the pen name Angelica Banks. A trilogy of adventure stories is published in and published in Australia, Germany and the USA. And so that's enough from me. I'm very pleased now to hand over to Danielle. Well, hello, everybody. It's um, quite an extraordinary thing to invite so many people into my living room, but here you are in, in my living room, my bookshelf behind me. So I was asked to present a webinar with the title Secrets of an Award-Winning, of Writing an Award-Winning Novel. And I figured that there are two time-honoured ways of going about such a thing. One way is to tell you my own secrets by telling you the, the story of how I've written my novels. And the other is to tell you more general secrets, things that I've learned along the way about writing, things that might help you uh, with your writing if it's something that you're keen to try or that you're already doing. 
So I've decided I'll do a bit of both of those things. Uh, we'll start with my own personal secrets and then we'll move on to some more general ones. So one of my secrets, I guess, is uh, that I was lucky. I was lucky, first of all, to be born in Tasmania, which is hands down the best place in the world to be a writer, uh, in part because we pretty much have stories in the drinking water and also because we have the most wonderful community of readers who are really uh, passionate about reading about their own home. So I, I grew up in Hobart. Uh, for those of you who are Tasmanians or who've spent time in Tasmania, you may have heard of this thing called the flannelette curtain that separates uh, the northern suburbs from the other suburbs. I didn't quite grow up on the north side of, of the flannelette curtain. I grew up bang on the flannelette curtain, if that tells you a little bit about my upbringing. Uh, I was educated at Friends School in Hobart which is where my mum has been teaching for over 50 years now. And again, I was really lucky because I was there in the 70s and 80s, which was a particularly rich period of time for the, the Friends School. I was educated by, by Quakers and Quakers who really walked their talk and genuinely did try to nurture um, the individual talents of their individual students. Another way that I was lucky is that I was one of those fortunate people who always knew what they wanted to do with their life. I always knew I wanted to be a writer. So I remember telling my mum when I was about eight years old, she picked me up from school and we were in her little mellow yellow beetle outside Birchall's bookshop in Moona. And she asked me what had happened at school that day. And I said that our teacher had asked us all, what do you want to be when you grow up? And most of the kids were at the sort of nurse, fireman, policeman stage of life, but um, at least one child in the class said they wanted to be an ophthalmologist, not that any of us knew what that was, but I said, well, I'm going to be an author. And um, I think it's pretty lucky when, when you're born with that kind of direction. But those of you who are listening who are creative, you probably know what happens when creative children declare their hand and say, I want to be a writer or I want to be an artist or I want to be an actress. What happens then is that well-meaning adults um, ask them what kind of real job they're going to get, what kind of backup plan they're going to have for when it doesn't work out. Um, and for a while there, quite a lot of people in my life had me convinced that I would want to be a lawyer. Um, I guess it's a kind of wordy, talky kind of profession. Um, and then because I liked animals, I thought I wanted to be a vet for a while. When I was in grade nine, we had a computer program where you could input all your details and it would tell you what kind of job you should have. And that computer program told me I'd be a really good copy editor. But by the time I actually got to university and I embarked on an arts degree, yep, one of those beautiful and much maligned things, I had learned that there was such a thing as being an English academic. And so I had developed a plan that was more or less do honours in English, then a PhD, then stay at university for the rest of my life. Now, parts of that have already happened and some of it could yet happen, but it didn't happen the way that I thought it would. When I was 19, I I graduated with my arts degree. I started kind of stupidly early at university, still had braces, couldn't get a drink at the uni bar. Um, so I graduated at 19 and then slightly by accident, I got a job as a journalist at a small suburban newspaper. Some of you might remember it's called the Southern Star, no longer exists. Now the job was just meant to be a sideshow while I completed my honors degree and uh, got a scholarship to do a PhD. That was my official plan. But journalism turned out to be actually great for me because I learned how to write every day. I learned how to write when I didn't feel like it. And I learned how to write when I didn't have any ideas. So I just had to learn to get over myself and write every single day. That was great training for any writer. Uh, I also had some great sub-editors, um, often crabby, often drunk, but some great sub-editors nonetheless who whipped me into shape. Um, being taught by, by really cross old men about how to um, structure a news story actually holds a lot of lessons for um, structuring any kind of story, I think. So again, I was fortunate there. So journalism captured me and rather than going straight on to a PhD as had been the plan, I 
ended up moving uh, from the suburban newspaper to Hobart's Metropolitan Daily newspaper, The Mercury, and I was the arts and editor, arts and um, environment reporter there for several years. And after that, I went to the Parks and Wildlife Service as, as a media officer. So they were all great jobs. Um, being at the Parks and Wildlife Service enabled me to travel all over my home state. I got to go to the Western Arthurs. I got to go to lots of islands in Bass Strait. I even went to Macquarie Island. So I was sort of inadvertently filling up a well that I would draw on later as, as a fiction writer by having all these amazing experiences. So there I was working as a journalist, but in my heart, that desire to write fiction was still really burning away. Um, I had another lucky break when I was 25 and I was working at parks and wildlife and I ended up sailing on a square rigged sailing ship from Sydney to Hobart to cover the tall ships race. And uh, on that ship, I met a guy, I'm married to him now, but uh, in those early days of getting to know each other, I shared with him that what I really wanted to do was write novels. And uh, he's a delightfully direct person, some might even say quite blunt. And he said, well, why aren't you doing that then? And since it seemed so obvious to him that that's what I should be doing, um, I got on with it. We moved from Tasmania to Western Australia and uh, I did a PhD there at Edith Cowan University. Uh, so again, I was really lucky to stumble on the creative writing program at Edith Cowan University and to the supervisor that I had there, whose name was Richard Rossiter. I think it's probably fair to say that um, Edith Cowan University wasn't the most prestigious university in Australia at that time and probably not even the most prestigious university in Western Australia, but its writing program in the early 1990s was absolutely superb and uh, I'm just so lucky that I had the opportunity to go through that program and so lucky that I had the supervisor that I did. So my thesis, as Kate kindly mentioned in the introduction, was a novel called The Alphabet of Light and Dark. And that's set on Bruny Island, um, just off uh, the southern coast of Tasmania, which is where my great, great grandfather, Captain William Hawkins, was the lighthouse keeper, longest serving lighthouse keeper in Australian history. And he left behind uh, a memoir. And uh, it's evident to me that there's a little bit of um, a couple of things that I've inherited from Captain Hawkins. He was quite the storyteller himself. That's evident from his memoir. He was also quite a mischief maker. And uh, I'm quite, um, I, I think that there's a bit of mischief in me too. And I really relate to the mischief in the pages of his journal. So that thesis, which was the combination of a novel and an accompanying essay, um, was passed as a, as a thesis. But more importantly than that, uh, it won the 2002 Australian Vogels Literary Prize for an unpublished manuscript. Now, that was, that was really huge because it propelled me from being an aspiring writer to being a published author. And not only that, uh, a prize winning author of whom much was expected. And winning that prize also led to me getting a job back at the University of Tasmania at my alma mater, but this time as a lecturer in creative writing. So I'd imagined myself for myself a future, perhaps as an English academic, I've ended up being an even better thing, I think, a creative writing academic. I think I have easily the best job at the University of Tasmania. I have uh, the most wonderful time because why wouldn't you? I get to enthuse my students about writing. I get to meet all of these wonderful uh, young people and older people who come through my classroom with amazing stories to tell. And it's really just my job to encourage them and enthuse them and, and tell them whatever I can about writing. Now, here's a pretty obvious secret about uh, writing award-winning novels. It's easier, um, a lot easier, when you don't have a whole heap of dependents. So at the time I wrote that first novel, The Alphabet of Light and Dark, I had a boyfriend and a puppy. And to be honest, that was a pretty big secret weapon. And by the time I started work on my next book, which is called Rosie Little's Cautionary Tales for Girls, I wasn't in such a great position anymore because by that time I had a husband, a dog, a baby and an academic career. Uh, 
in truth, it would have been strategic to follow up the alphabet of light and dark with another novel. But I didn't do that. I had a young baby and I had a job. So instead of writing another novel, I wrote a collection of short fiction. It felt to me more possible to hold those smaller pieces of fiction in my mind at that time uh, when I, I had a little you know, newborn. A novel, I think, would have been beyond me at that point in my life. As, as an interesting aside here, um, I read somewhere once that for every child you have, you sacrifice two novels. So if any of you are contemplating having children, you might want to consider that uh, little ratio. So, you know, of course, my children are miracles and I adore them, but there's absolutely no doubt in my mind I, I would have written more if I had chosen not to be a mother. Anyway, uh, that second book of mine, Rosie Little's Cautionary Tales for Girls, led to me being named a Sydney Morning Herald Best Young Novelist of the Year for the second time. And that book was published in some overseas territories, which was uh, really great. But even so, I seemed determined to sabotage my writing career. And by the time I started work on my third book, I had a husband, a young child, a demanding job at the university, and drum roll please, I also had infant twins. Um, so by now I was no longer even writing fiction. Uh, I was writing non-fiction. One of the reasons writing fiction is so difficult is because it involves so many decisions. When you're writing fiction, absolutely everything is up for grabs. You uh, effectively have to make the world anew. Nonfiction, on the other hand, is comparatively easy because the choices you have to make are about words and paragraphs and how to order the material. You don't have to make the world um, because it already exists. So the nonfiction book that I wrote was the biography of a crazy Tasmanian lady called Marjorie Bly. She's the goddess of handy home hints, and she was widely rumoured to be the inspiration for Dame Edna Everidge. Now, as part of writing this book, I tracked down Barry Humphreys to ask him about uh, the relationship between Edna and Marjorie. And it turns out that while Marjorie didn't exactly inspire the creation of Edna, there's a very definite connection between those two women. Now, that was a great book to write because it was nonfiction at a time when I needed to write something, you know, relatively um, easier for me to write at that time. But the truth is that I was really struggling with the anxiety of being a mother of multiples and I had lost my confidence utterly. Uh, I, I thought that the book that I was writing Although I was really enjoying writing and I was enjoying the research, I, I thought I'd be lucky if the book got published here in Australia, let alone any further afield. But it turned out that I had a little fairy godmother in the shape of the Australian cartoonist Kaz Cook. And Kaz um, heard a rumour that I was writing Marjorie Bly's biography and got in contact with me and, and asked me, is this true? Are you writing Marjorie's biography? And, so we got chatting and she helped me uh, get my confidence back a little bit. And she was also instrumental in getting that book published by text publishing in Melbourne. Um, curiously enough, it later went on to be published by a very a venerable New York publishing house, FSG. And it was also translated into Dutch. So a book that I thought could really only have a, a life in Tasmania has actually had quite, a, quite an international life. It was around about this um, time in my life that I teamed up with my dear friend, Heather Rose, Tasmanian writer, author of the Museum of Modern Love and, and Bruni. And together we became somebody called Angelica Banks. Now, Angelica is a children's writer and her, in, her books include Finding Serendipity, A Week Without Tuesday and Blueberry Pancakes Forever. I guess that Working with Heather is another one of my secrets. We're very, very different writers, but from working together, we've learned a huge amount from, from each other. I think um, 
it's such a privilege to work so closely with another writer and to get an insight into their process. I think it's it's led to a, a development of skills um, for, for both of us, I think I can safely say, um, because we have such a different set of skills. It's been amazing to get an insight, a really close insight into how another writer works. Uh, we have an almost stupid amount of fun too. When we appear in public as Angelica Banks, we wear blue velvet coats and red wigs, um, rather like one of the main characters in the novel, the, the writer Serendipity Smith, who's the mother of the main character, Tuesday McGillicuddy. I'll show you some pictures in a minute of um, Heather and I dressed up as Serendipity Smith slash Angelica Banks. So the book that came next in my career after I had finished Housewife Superstar, the biography, and after we'd kicked off the children's trilogy, was a book called Mother's Grimm. And a bit like Rosie Little's Cautionary Tales for Girls, it was a collection of short fiction that um, had fairy tale themes, but these were long stories rather than short stories. Um, it's the only one of my books that has neither won a prize nor been shortlisted for a prize nor been published overseas. And yet I think it's the best thing I've ever written and it's probably my favorite of um, all my books. I wrote it as an act of sheer will and determination. In order to carve out time away from my three children and my job, I got into the habit of getting up at four o'clock in the morning and writing until seven in the morning. Now that hurt, I can tell you. Um, it was productive. I got the book done, but I think I nearly blew myself apart. So by this point in my story, I was seven books in and I'd written a novel a collection of short stories, a biography, a collection of long stories, and I'd co-written a trilogy of children's books. I was yet to attempt the same genre twice, so I was hardly a publisher's dream of consistency and predictability. So I did the obvious thing, and for my eighth book, I tried something entirely new. I tried commercial fiction. You see, I'd had this idea kicking around in my head for years, uh, ever since I was a young journalist at the Suburban Paper. Back then when I was working at that paper, uh, I had a friend who was a Virgo and he was really obsessed with the idea that horoscopes in that paper were really accurate for his life. I don't know why, because they were those kind of really syndicated horoscopes that were probably computer generated. Anyway, at that paper, we had a really small staff. So all of us um, had to be able to do everything I had a powerful login for that reason and one night I was working late and I realised I had access to everything in the paper, including the horoscopes. And I realised I could change the horoscopes for Virgo and make them even more creepily accurate for my friend. Um, now I'm not saying I ever definitely did that, um, but I certainly thought about it and it gave me an idea for a novel, a novel that became Starcrossed. Now, Starcross was always going to be a tied up with a bow romantic comedy. And it's so different from my other fiction that I invented a whole new writer to write it for me. And her name is Minnie Dark. At first, I really thought I'd be able to do a genuine kind of Elena Ferrante thing and keep my true identity a secret. But the publishing industry relies so much on authors being prepared to do their own publicity that this just didn't turn out to be possible. But Starcrossed uh, turned out to be a real breakthrough book for me. Um, there were auctions for the publishing rights here in Australia, in the USA and in several other countries. It's now published in over 25 international territories and the film rights sold to a Hollywood production company uh, that has plans for a six part TV series. Uh, that said, I'm not holding my breath over the TV series because film is just a really cruelly uncertain business. So Minnie's success with Starcrossed has sort of somewhat eclipsed my own writing for the moment. Um, you don't usually win prizes with commercial fiction, but Starcrossed won the People's Choice uh, section of the Margaret Scott Award, one of the Tasmanian Premier's literary prizes. And especially since Margaret Scott taught me in my first year at university, I was pretty thrilled with that. Um, Minnie's second book, The Lost Love Song, came out in March this year in Australia and is scheduled for release in the UK, Germany and the USA and 
I'm working at the moment on Minnie's third book. So that was the rapid fire story of my personal secrets about writing. And what I hope you got from those disclosures is I've been lucky at a lot of junctures, but I've also faced some challenges and most of them that I created myself by committing to a family, a job and a writing career. I've had to work hard and I've had to juggle a lot. Um, people sometimes ask me how I do it and I just tell them that there are times when I'm really, really tired. Uh, and even though that's true, I can't think which of those th three things I do that I would give up. So, um, Brandon, I'd love to show everyone some PowerPoint pictures now, if that would be okay. Um, just very quickly, here are, are my books, uh, The Alphabet of Light and Dark, the first one, Rosie Little's Cautionary Tales for Girls, the short stories, Housewife Superstar, the very best of Marjorie Bly, the biography, and Mother's Grim, um, my my favourite, but don't, don't tell the others. Brandon, could we see the next slide now? So here are some pictures of Mini Dark's books. There's um, a, a pretty standard cover of Starcrossed at the top and the Australian cover of The Lost Love Song at the bottom. Um, over to the left of my screen, I hope it's also the left of yours, is the uh, US journal, uh, the US cover of um, The Lost Love Song. And then over on the other side, there are some of the uh, international jackets for Starcrossed. It's had a lot of different names uh, as it's moved around the world. The, the French means something like when the stars tangle and um, the German means under a good star. It's rather lovely to get your book in, in different languages. Uh, next slide, please, Brendan. So as I promised, here's a picture of Heather and I dressed as Angelica Banks at the launch of, of one of our children's novels. And then you can see Heather and I, they're working together without our red wigs on and some of the jackets um, from Australia and from the USA of the children's trilogy. Just one more slide to show you here, please, Brendan. And that's uh, a slide of a couple of other books I've been involved with, with my colleague at the university, Professor Ralph Crane. Uh, he and I have edited two collections of um, Tasmanian fiction, one Deep South and the other one called Island Story. So when you're ready, Brendan, you can come back to me. Thank you very much for that. So now that I've told you my secrets, I wanna tell you a handful of general secrets, things that I've learned about writing in my travels. And I really hope these little kernels of advice might help you uh, if you're keen to start writing creatively or writing creatively more often than you already are. So the first thing that I wanna share with you uh, here is the most profound thought that I've ever had. So, um, you know, after I'm dead, if people quote me, this is what I wanna be quoted on. You ready? Here's my really profound quote. Everything ever written, every great book, every famous poem, every amazing film script is just something that somebody one day sat down and wrote. Now that might sound really, really obvious, and perhaps it is, it's also profound, I think, because it's really easy to put off writing. Most writers are procrastinators. I am an A-class procrastinator. Uh, if some of you are thinking that you want to write, I'll bet that you have other thoughts like, well, I'll do it when I have more time, or I'll do it when I retire, or I'll do it when my kids leave home. We also have a tendency to think that we're going to be visited by the muse now that might happen, but it's actually amazing how much more often the muse comes to visit you when you're already sitting at your desk. The Australian writer Bryce Courtney was once asked, what do young writers need? And he said, bum glue, meaning that you needed just to stick to your seat. And he was famous for having a belt at his writing chair and he would actually strap himself in. Roald Dahl used to settle himself into a big chair and put a, a green baize covered board over his lap with a rolled up towel underneath it to get the board at just the right angle so he could write. And once he was in that chair with the board on his lap, it was really hard for him to get out. Now, we tend to think that it's not worth writing unless what we write is going to be amazing or we have to wait to write until we feel ready or something like that. We feel intimidated by all of the great works of literature that you know cover our shelves. But the truth is that everything ever written is just something that somebody one day sat down and wrote. So unless you sit down and write, you won't join that conversation. 
So that was the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to tell you, uh, and this is, this is information that um, comes from Julia Cameron's very famous book, The Artist's Way, which is a book that you may or may not have come across. It's a, it's a 12 step program for blocked creatives, this book, and it's become a classic for writers, especially. I encourage my students to read it because it's full of great advice. And I should tell you that in my university classroom, I'm not afraid to set books that are a bit self-helpy or a bit wind chimey. Um, it's definitely not all highbrow literary studies in my classroom. Uh, so I've, I learned a lot from the artist's way myself. And one of the most important things I learned is this thing that I'm gonna share with you now. You will get a lot more writing done using enthusiasm as a tool, as a fuel, than you will using sheer white knuckle discipline as your fuel. A lot of people think that the way that you get things done is only through discipline. Discipline really helps. I'm not going to argue with that. I did have to be really disciplined during that period of my life when I was getting up at 4am to write. But discipline isn't the high octane fuel. That's enthusiasm. So if you can approach your writing with a sense of childish playfulness, if you can approach it with a sense of genuine mischievous delight, you will get far more done than if you're just relying on white knuckled grit. Julia Cameron advises you that you really need to take care of this little inner artist of yours. She said, think of your inner artist as being like a child. You have to mollycoddle this little inner artist if you want them to produce work for you. It's no good whipping them to be creative. You have to coax. So if you want to write, I suggest that you do just that and that you're really kind and sweet to your inner artist. Treat them like a precious child. Um, consider going out and buying yourself a really nice notebook, some pretty pens, I don't know, sparkly stickers if you like that sort of thing. Whatever else that inner artist child of yours wants. If she wants to go to an art gallery, take her. If she wants to go jumping in puddles in gumboots, go get the gumboots out and go jump in puddles. So start your writing day playfully. Uh, write stupid things if you want to. Have fun. That sense of enthusiasm, trust me, will get you a lot further than any kind of whip. So if you're going to try getting up early in the morning to write, um, try doing it not as an act of desperation, but as an act of mischief. Like, haha, here I am, up before dawn, before all of the grown-ups mucking about with my creative project. Remember, enthusiasm is your best tool and your best fuel. The third thing that I wanted to tell you is something that I've learned from teaching writing at the University of Tasmania for the last 17 years. It took me a really long time to work out why it was that some of my students seemed unable to bring a scene or a story to life on the page. Don't get me wrong, lots of them could. There's no shortage of talent in the world. Um, but from time to time, I've really struggled to work out how to help some of my students get their work to really sing. Then one day in a tutorial, I had this light bulb moment and I asked a student how much time he spent in the world of his story before trying to write about it. And he looked at me as if I was a total idiot. And what I realized that day was a brilliant thing to realize. I realized that actually a lot of beginner writers are stuck on the idea that the black marks on the page and the combinations of words on the page or the black pixels on the white screen, that that is what writing is made of. Now, some people write really naturally, just like other people can dance really naturally. Um, other people need to learn the steps. And I've learned that some beginner writers need to be explicitly taught that they need to actively imagine. So the writing that appears on a page is actually nothing but a code. It's a code that enables a reader to reconstitute in their minds something that the writer has already seen in their mind. What that means is writers have to see it. We have to smell it in our imagination. We have to hear it in our imagination. We have to cry over the sad parts. We have to laugh at the funny parts. Some of my students look at me askance when I, I tell them that I sit at my desk and laugh hysterically or cry until I have a headache. But seriously, if I can't move myself to tears, how can I do that to anyone else? And if I can't 
make myself laugh, how can I expect anyone else to laugh? So while you're out buying the pens and, you know, beautiful diary and the groovy stickers for your inner artist child, just, you know, pop in some hankies or Kleenex or whatever along the way. The fourth and final thing that I want to tell you about writing has to do with the Sydney Opera House. That's right, the Sydney Opera House. So can you just bring the Sydney Opera House to mind? The Sydney Opera House was born in the mind of the architect Jan Utzon. He was a man with the imagination and the vision and the creativity to dream up that amazing building. But without engineering and without skill and without technical proficiency, that building would never have become manifest in the world. Now, writing is just like that. You have to have the vision. You have to be able to see the amazing thing that's never been created before. But you also have to have the technical prowess or the whole thing will just fall over. I give my students an equation for writing, which is this. I tell them writing is made up of two things. One, your unique vision of the world. And two, your ability to use language to transmit that vision to other people. Really fortunately, uh, you can work on both sides of that equation. So you can get better at both those things. A lot of people ask me, but can you teach creative writing? Well, of course. Imagination is just another muscle that you can stretch and build up. All you have to do is practice, practice imagining things. You can do that while you're walking. You can do it while you're driving. You can do it when you wake up in the morning before you get out of bed. Um, great place to do it is in the shower, but the water bills do tend to get kind of expensive. I know this from experience. You can also work on your capacity to use language. How do you do that? Well, you read, you read and you read and you read and you read. Stephen King, who describes himself as a slow reader, he reads about 70 books a year. Um, if you're serious about writing, you should be reading at least as much. It doesn't matter how you read, you can read a paper and ink book, you can read an e-book, um, you can listen to audiobooks. I'd say I get through an audiobook uh, about every week or week and a half. So that's about 40 or 50 extra books a year that I get to read by pumping them in through the ears. In order to develop your skills with language, you need to read, but you also need to write, play with words, do crossword puzzles, play Scrabble, play Balderdash, write letters, write in a diary, have a tilt at a haiku, a sonnet, a piece of flash fiction, a short story. You don't have to be able to take three months long service leave or wait until the summer holidays or until the muse speaks to you or worst of all, until you feel more confident. Teach yourself to write in little grabs. Teach yourself to write in noisy places. Just get some great noise cancelling earphones if you need to. So Brendan, can we have a look at that last slide so I can just run through those four things that, um, that I wanted to share with everyone. Here's that first one. Everything ever written, every great book, every famous poem, every amazing film script, it's just something that somebody wrote one day. So don't be intimidated, just sit down and write. The second thing, you're gonna get more writing done using enthusiasm as a fuel than using white knuckle discipline. So be playful and nurture your inner child, your inner artist like they were a precious child. Third thing, remember to imagine Spend time in a scene that you want to write. Play it in your head like a movie. Imagine, imagine, imagine. It's just another muscle that you can develop. And finally, remember the Sydney Opera House. Writing is made up of two things. Your unique vision of the world and your ability to create, to use language to convey that vision to other people. And you can work on both of those things. So I hope that you will find those four little kernels of advice useful um, for you. And I'm going to hand back over to Kate now, who hopefully has some questions for me. Thank you, um, uh, Danielle. That was just really, really wonderful. I'm I'm no writer, but it's just it's just magical to be able to get into the mind of somebody somebody who is. And um, as an enthusiastic reader, um, wonderful to imagine what it's like. I, I, I guess while you were speaking, I was thinking, what is your perfect environment for writing? What, what gets you to that kind of enthusiasm and that, I don't, do you use a belt, um, using a green baize board? What are you, what are you doing? You've got a pretty, 
pretty amazing um, environment where you are right now. I'm just curious about what's your perfect spot for writing? Uh, well, I, I just love to be alone. Um, you know, I have, I have three kids. I, you know, have a lot of students. So when I get to be alone, I'm pretty happy. So that in itself is pretty exciting. I, I'll tell you another daggy secret since, you know, this is all about revealing my secrets. I have some little guardians on my desk. Um, one of them is Yoda. And it's a little just Yoda head. In fact, it was the it was the lid of a bubble bath. Um, and I love Yoda. And Yoda just sits there and he says to me, do or do not. There is no try. <laughs> and, uh, and the other um, little guardians I have, I call one of them enthusiasm. And the other one is patience. And enthusiasm is really good at the beginning of a project. And patience is really good at the end. So i I have little uh, visual cues around my working environment. I usually have a pin-up board with, with ideas and so on. I seriously do not care how childish or daggy I need to be to, um, to get my creativity working. Um, probably once upon a time, I would have been more secretive about just what a dag I am, but now I just don't care if people know. <laughs> Thank you. Now, look, I would encourage the um, the audience today, our alumni from uh, wherever you are today, do use the Q&A function to get your questions coming through. Daniel, there's been a few already on a, on a similar theme, which is, is there still a place for a pseudonym today in the, in the 21st century? And, and why do we why do we still use pseudonyms? We, I'm no author. Why do, why do authors still use pseudonyms, um, particularly, as you say, for commercial um, writing? Oh, what a great question. Thank you to those of you who asked that question. I recently wrote an essay in the Sydney Review of Books, which wouldn't be too difficult to find if you just Googled it. So Sydney Review of Books, um, I think that the headline is W for Wood. And in that I go into quite a lot of detail about my feelings about pseudonyms. Um, one thing to remember is that publishers and writers uh, and readers are not terribly forgiving of writers who do different stuff. Um, publishers and readers really like you to do as advertised on the tin. So if you've done one sort of thing once and then they see your name again, it's like a brand. They want you to do the same thing. Um, so if you're going to do something completely different, you kind of need a new brand or a, you know, a new name on the biscuit tin. That's a really simple reason that you might choose to use a pseudonym. Um, you know, there's been a long history of pseudonyms. The uh, Bronte sisters became the Bell brothers because they faced so much discrimination because they were women. Um, Agatha Christie wrote romances as Mary Westmacott. Um, she rebranded herself for that purpose. Stephen King also had uh, a pseudonym. He did it for a totally different reason because he had a publisher who said, you can only write one book a year, Stephen. And he was so prolific, he wanted to write more. So he um, got himself a pseudonym so he could have more than one book a year. Um, so there are lots of reasons. I, I confess that I actually really love the mischief of it. I love the kind of, the kind of dress ups, you know, I can become a whole new person. If I had my way, I'd just create a new author for every book. Thank you. Uh, now, Daryl Peebles has asked um, a question around that sort of relationship between um, Barry Humphreys and um, Edna and uh, Marjorie Bly. And um, you mentioned in your conversation um, th uh, that you had with, with Barry Humphreys that Marjorie Bly was not the um, inspiration for Dame Edna. But did you discuss with him if there was a point in Edna's life where Marjorie may have had an influence? There's a flip side to this conversation, which is, did it work the other way? Did Edna ever creep into your thought process while you were writing Housewife Superstar? Hello, Daryl. How nice that you're here. Um, so uh, Dame Edna Everidge started her life in the 50s, early 50s. And Marjorie Bly didn't really start publishing until the late 1960s. But Barry Humphreys read Marjorie's books and thought that they were hilarious. So Barry and a bunch of other Australian expats living in London used to read her books out, out loud to each other. They used to cook recipes out of her books. They used to hand them around and, and laugh at some of the crazy things in her, in her books. And when Edna started to publish, um, so she wrote um, a number of sort of handy home hint manuals and so on, um, she relied very heavily on Marjorie's, um, the way she structured her books and on the tone that she took and if, if you analyse the contents of Edna's books and Marjorie's books very closely, you will find some very conspicuous overlaps. Thank you. 
And I think there was a second part to that question, wasn't it? Which was the other it, way around. Yeah. It creep, in, creep in. Well, uh, I do know that Marjorie and Barry Humphreys never met. Um, Barry Humphreys came to Launceston once and he spoke on 70X, the radio station, and he put out a call. He said, I'd love to meet Marjorie Bly. And various of Marjorie's friends rang her and said, um, Barry Humphreys is wanting to meet you. He's talking about you on the radio. And he, he offered to basically go and, and meet her. And she said, unfortunately, she couldn't that night because there was a meeting of the Devonport Friendship Club. And I think there was some kind of scandalous coup going on in the, um, you know, in the, in the, the group. And so she, you know, she basically turned him down in favour of going to a meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, look, uh, a number of people have asked a question um, around um, what what we really mean by commercial writing as distinct to any other kind of writing and, and the, how, how you sort of change your tack for that. So what what's the difference between commercial writing and other kinds of writing? OK, uh, this is a really interesting question that sometimes comes to me from um, people who are, are not so much in in the publishing world so i guess people in the publishing world talk about these categories of literary and commercial fiction as if they're a real thing um, whereas i think if you try to push those categories too far it would be difficult to find out exactly where the boundaries are between literary and commercial fiction um, i think that we could safely say um, that commercial fiction has uh, more of an emphasis on uh, story on plot on character on resolved endings while literary fiction perhaps has um, more emphasis on the language or perhaps um, could tend to be more a literature of ideas rather than of plot and entertainment so I think those generalizations are probably fairly safe to make of course you get books that cover all of those points that I've just just raised what I tend to think is um, like I said, I've written literary fiction and commercial fiction. So I've had a tilt at both. Um, when you're writing literary fiction, it's as if you're being asked to make something that has never existed before. So let's use a dressmaking analogy here. Um, if you're writing a, a, a literary novel, it's as if you're a dressmaker and someone has come to you and said, make me a dress. That's about all the information you get. So it doesn't matter what fabric it's made out of, how short or long it is, or what kind of style it's in. You've got free range to make this whole new thing, yeah? But if you're writing commercial fiction, it's more like somebody comes to you and says, make me a red satin cocktail dress with short sleeves and a sweetheart neckline, but make it like no red satin cocktail frock with a knee length hem and a sweetheart neckline and short sleeves that I have ever seen before. So there are ways in which writing commercial fiction is incredibly exacting um, because there are um, things that you're expected to do. There are plot points that you're expected to hit. There are things that a commercial fiction reader wants from you that you simply must deliver. Whereas um, when you're writing literary fiction, it's much more on your terms, much less on the reader's terms, I think. Thank you. Um, Daniel, there are so many questions coming in, uh, which is really good and a real mark of the um, of you as our speaker today. So I'm trying to bunch a few together and I apologize to people who've asked very specific questions, but I'm taking thematically some, some questions here. So um, a key one that people are asking is, how do you go about getting published? Ah. So, you know, how, how, what steps could people take to getting themselves um, a publisher? I'm teaching a third year unit at, um, at the university this year where we're focusing on exactly that question. We're going to study how do you get published for an entire semester. And uh, the publishing industry is complex and opaque. Uh, there is no one pathway. Um, a lot of, lot, a lot of publishers don't take unsolicited manuscripts anymore. Mm. Um, there are even agents now who aren't taking unsolicited manuscripts. So one way that you can get published is to get yourself an agent and then your agent represents you to, to publishers, but even getting an agent is getting harder. Literary magazines are struggling. Um, basically, the sorts of advice I give to my students is get published where you can. So write short fiction. If you can get it published in any of the literary magazines that we still have, you're starting to build up a name for yourself. 
enter short story competitions, again, you're building a name for yourself. You might be recognised. You People might start to pay attention to you as, as a writer. It's a matter of getting yourself known. It's a matter of meeting people. This can be difficult for us down here in Tasmania, but mm. um, you've simply got to find ways to get yourself noticed and keep putting yourself out there into the public uh, domain. There are things like um, writer development programs that are run by publishers and by places like Varuna, Australia, the Australian Writing House. So those manuscript development programs are really good, good ways to go about it. So any way that you can get your work out there into the public domain is, is likely to be helpful. Thank you. It's uh, clear from a lot of the questions coming in uh, that that's a, a easier said than said than done, but just trying and trying and trying and keep persisting. Um, another group of questions thematically are really around process and how much time uh, you devote to certain things. So clearly it's going to be different for everybody, but uh, lots of questions interested around um, how do you determine what ideas are actually worth pursuing? And if you get stuck on a certain characterization that isn't progressing forward, what you do, do you completely change your idea or try and unlock it? Uh, somebody's asking about um, how much time is spent on actually factually researching the things that you want to uh, put in, in, in your book. And then the, the, the time and process around how many redrafting and redrafting do you do you go through? So all of those things I think are around the process of actually finessing mm -hmm. to a point that you've got a, a book worthy of someone taking a look at it. Sure. I think that um, one of the things you develop as a writer when you've spent a lot of time doing it. So remember I've, you know, since I was 19 years old, I've been writing for a living. So, you know, that's coming up for 30 years now that I've been writing every day. And one of the things that you um, develop is that judgment to know when something is close to finished. And it, it's as if it has a little grace note for you. It goes, Ta -da! Um, so you, you get the feeling and that you know when something is right. It can take a really long time to get there. Um, Heather, Rose and I, when we were working on one of our books, um, chapter 17 of Finding Serendipity, I think we wrote that chapter 17, 18, 19 times until we heard that little chime that went, yes, this is right. Um, so uh, there are days when I wrestle with my writing I might start out with a, a thousand words and I'm really hoping that by the end of the day, I've got 4,000 words, but I might end up with 500. I might actually go backwards. And some of those days are so dispiriting and I feel so terrible at the end of those days. And I think, how can I possibly ever be a productive writer if I'm gonna go backwards? But what I've learned over time is that you have to go through the bad days to get back to the good days. The bad days are actually part of the process because you're learning something about your story. Uh, I talked, a bit about how the reason that writing fiction is so much harder than writing non-fiction is because you have to make the world. You have to make decision after decision after decision after decision. And that's why writing a book, writing fiction takes a really long time because you've got a million decisions to make and each one then opens out into a million other decisions. So if you find that something's not working right back here in your story, you might have made decisions and decisions that follow and then you have to wind it all back. Um, last year, I completed a novel to deadline, The Lost Love Song. I'd completed the, deadline, the novel to deadline in July, read it and realized that there was a better novel just underneath it. Uh, and so I had to chew up all of the time I would have had to do a structural edit and a copy edit with my publishers and rewrite it. And I don't mean I, I did the next draft with the spelling mistakes fixed. I mean, I rewrote it. I started again and rewrote the novel. And you just have to be prepared to do that level of work. Uh, Marcus Zusak rewrote The Book Thief with several different points of view. Heather Rises, The Museum of Modern Love, that took 11 years. Um, it's not easy. It, it just does take a lot of work. I was interested in um, the things you said uh, earlier and then just in that response there around the difference between uh, the relative relative ease of uh, fiction versus non-fiction. But um, uh, Helen has asked um, about the challenges of bringing life to non-fiction. And do you have any particular strategies and techniques for ensuring that non-fiction sings and um, leaps out from the page as much as a fiction uh, work might? Yeah, 
I, I think you have to be in love with your subject matter. So I wrote this biography of Marjorie Bly. And I mean, Marjorie is somebody you have to tread very carefully with because some of the things that she did and said were so outlandish, but at the same time, I was deeply impressed by her. I, I admired her. So I always had to walk this tightrope between kind of ever so slightly mocking her, but also taking her incredibly seriously. And I think if you're writing nonfiction, you, you have to have a passion for your subject matter that you're going to convey on the page. Um, one of the nonfiction books that I always recommend to my students is Helen MacDonald's H is for Hawk, which is a, a book about uh, falconry and grief and, and a lot of other things. Um, but from having read that book, I, I feel like I can see the hawk that she was training. I can see the colour of its feathers and the colour of its eyes. And she, she brought that to life because she had such incredible focus on this creature and, and was prepared to, to put all of that love and focus and intelligence into her writing about it. Thank you. I think a really um, important topic uh, that you raised earlier um, and has come up through the questions is the question of confidence and particularly for new um, writers, um, young writers, um, how to deal with criticism. So it's been, you talked a lot about the value of collaboration and having people around you that sort of help with that. But uh, somebody has speculated as to whether your experience as a, as a young journalist helped because you're very used to having your work in a public domain and finessing your craft. For people who've got none of that experience, the, the anxiety over actually releasing your work and having people comment on it. How, how do you deal with that kind of right balance between criticism and feedback? but in a way that's positive as opposed to destructive. Yeah, look, I was lucky to have, um, you know, strips torn off me by sub-editors when I was a young journalist. I, you know, it was trial by fire and I, I got some pretty thick skin there, um, which is not to say that I'm, that I'm, you know, some incredible rhinoceros. Of course I want people to like my work. Um, Oh, crikey, this is a really, really hard one. I think one of the things to do is to try and create your own support networks with other people who are at a similar stage to you. So when I was doing my PhD, um, there were a bunch of other people doing their PhDs at that time. None of us had published novels. We were all aspiring writers, um, but, but we had all joined a PhD program. Uh, and that writers group was really something special because we we critiqued each other's work and we pushed each other forward, but we were also very kind to each other. So if you can find um, a group that you can get together and, and, and have that kind of collegiality and, and ask questions of each other in deeply curious but kind ways, like what were you trying to do here and what was going on here? Um, and something important to remember about criticism, even if it feels harsh, is to remember that whoever gives it to you has made a contribution to you. They didn't have to. They didn't have to read your work. They didn't have to take the time to read it and say whatever thing they said, even if it hurt you. So somehow you've got to wire up your brain to go, okay, that person just made a contribution to me. I can accept it or reject it, but I should at some level be grateful that, that I got a response because no one has to read your work. Very good advice. Thank you, Danielle. Now, look, we're out of time, but in a bid to just try and quickly get through a few more questions, I'm going to give you one word. You've got one word answers to three uh, last questions, OK? OK. Uh, so then, then we'll have to we'll have to wrap up. So um, writing for adults or writing for children? Children. <laughs> OK. How many words per week do you get through? Widely variant. And um, a really interesting question. Um, uh, do you think that um, male authors would uh, think that they have to give up um, two books uh, per child as much as female authors would? No. 
on that potentially controversial <laughs> note, uh, we'll we'll call it a wrap right there. I'm so sorry to all of the people who sent in questions that uh, we didn't have time to get through. I think it's a real mark, Danielle, of how engaged and how interested people have been and the numbers of people we've had on this webinar. So a massive thank you um, to you for your time and being so open and um, helpful and expressive in, in the experience of being an author. And um, I'm just still blown away by the idea that you'd finish your degree at 19 and were already writing for a living by that time. So um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, and I'm sure that everyone on this call is silently joining me in um, thanking you for, um, for being with us. Um, so you. just to let, just to let everybody know that um, this afternoon's presentation will be available soon as a video via the Explore website. Um, I think that's coming up on your screen so that you've got the details there. Um, you will also soon receive an invitation to um, take part in another engaging webinar uh, that's coming up on the 19th of August with Sandra Murray, who's a lecturer in nutrition and food science with the School of um, uh, Health Science. And um, we'll be discussing, she'll be discussing what it takes to eat well during um, this current pandemic. Um, we would love to know if there's any more topics that you want us to um, explore and help you explore. Um, or perhaps you're a member of our alumni community that could actually offer some expertise and insights to the rest of the community. So please do reach out to the alumni team, uh, alumni at utas.edu.au if you've got some ideas there. But I will just finish by saying thank you so much again, Danielle. Um, everyone go away, enjoy reading and writing and have a wonderful weekend all. Thanks for being with us today.